Hi, this is Joe, and this is the Film Joe Podcast, where film talk happens. One, two, three, four. Hi, I'm Joe, your host, and I'm here with Carlos. Say hi, Carlos. Hi, Carlos. And welcome to the podcast where we talk about films, filmmakers, trends, the good, the bad, and the not so bad, all in the spirit and for the love of film. So, we are talking about westerns this week. Yeah. And so, you know, pretty much the western, it's it's been a genre that's been in film since the very beginning. Way back, I believe it was the early 1900s. So, uh, you know, and it's had its ups and downs and moments of glory. And, uh, you know, it's kind of faded, but it's still there. Mm-hmm. But first... <laughs> it's time for news bits. All right, so I don't got much... <laughs> What was that? The Karate Kid stance you were was, doing? It was uh, the Alex the Lion from Madagascar. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It just felt right. Yeah, I just turned around and he's doing this pose. I'm like, what? <laughs> 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 kind of caught me off guard. Um, So, Newsbits only got one major news bit, which is exciting and I can't wait. Beetlejuice 2 mm. from Warner Brothers has officially got a release date for September of next year. Just don't say his name three times. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. No, 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 no. You're, you're messing with powers you don't understand, man. <laughs> and returning in the director's chair is going to be Tim Burton. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, Michael Keaton, of course, nice. is coming back. Nice. Winona Ryder. Winona. And Jenna Ortega is officially signed on to the film. Yeah, not surprising. She's, she's popular right now. Oh, she's awesome. And of course, she was connected to a Tim Burton uh, series mm-hmm. Wednesday, Wednesday. So I think it was kind of a no-brainer when they were talking about, oh, let's see, she might or might not sign on. I'm like, I, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. She, she's in. Uh, but that's basically all, I unless you've heard of anything new. No. Okay. Yeah. Good, that, uh, no. Mm. Okay. Good enough. So now on to Ah, uh, you got it right this week. Okay, cool. So, what have you been checking out recently? I actually today just came back from watching uh, the Evil Dead Rise. Okay. Oh man, <laughs> it's on my watch report oh, as well. So good. Where do you start with this one? The uh, intro. I mean, first of all, we are huge Evil Dead fans. Bruce Campbell fan. Bruce Campbell, and even though he's not in this, no. You feel him. You you see. You, mm, he, he's mm. there. It, it's it's awesome. So, what were your impressions? So, I really liked it. It was a it was a very it was very gory. They're not super gory, but it had its its moments. Oh come on, they, that that it, elevator they, scene. Yeah, the, oh. <laughs> so it was it was really good. It tickled it tickled a little bit of me, and um, it was a pretty empty theater when I went. But then again, I went in like two in the afternoon on a random Thursday. Yeah, you're not gonna get much of a of a of a. Of a uh, sold out uh, stadium, yeah. stadium well, theater, 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 yeah. stadium theater. Yeah. yeah, same thing. Same thing. Well, you know the uh, the the opening weekend did really well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not surprised. Yeah, it, it did uh, some very decent box office, but I loved it because it had the Sam Raimi touch, the, the touch, the touch, the the certain things like the crazy eyes, you know, on the face yeah. that's covered in blood. You know, that's, that's, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bruce Campbell. You know, yeah. if, if anybody remembers either Evil Dead 1 or 2, his face is drenched in blood and his eyes are crazy wide open. Yeah. And you have that here. And, oh, credits to the young lady who played the possessed mom. Oh, my gosh. She was terrifyingly creepy. Yeah. And, you know, she's a beautiful woman. Mm-hmm. I've seen her in other films. But she has this smile. That just from ear to ear. Oh, yeah. One of those thin, wide, Joker-like smiles. And again, not to despair, she's she's not an unattractive woman, but she has that wide smile. So you add the makeup yeah. and everything. It's like, oh, geez. I mean, it's got stuff. How'd you like the eyeball sequence? Oh. <laughs> as soon as, uh, like... As soon as it panned over to the other kid and his mouth was wide open, I was like, oh, no, no. And it's it's a Sam Raimi move. Yeah. The, uh, oh, of course you have, so it had all the staples. It had the the crazy eyes. Yeah. The chainsaw. Yep. 
the, the buck, shotgun. The shotgun. Yeah. The buckets and buckets of blood. Yep. The Necronomicon Book of the Dead. Mm-hmm. And the recording. Yeah. It had it all. And it was perfect. It, Funny it, enough, I don't know if you noticed this, but when I was watching it, I was... Uh, um, I was listening to whatever the hell the priest was saying on the recording or the, the the vinyl, right? And he was saying, "Oh, this is the one of two, uh, one of the three volumes of the Book of the Dead." I was like, "Ah, so there's three. So there's a Necronomicon from the Evil Dead, the OGs. Mm-hmm. If that's still in the same universe, it's still in the of, same universe. Same, okay, so it's that one. I don't know if they kept the one from the remake is the same from the original. I don't know how that works. And then the Ash versus the Evil Dead. It was a, it's just a straight up." Um, the Necronomicon from his movies. Right. So that's possibly two out of the three. I don't know if they're going to do something different. Keep it well, the same. if you think about it, Evil Dead 1 was great. Amazing. Evil Dead 2 was kind of a remake, but it wasn't, and it had nothing to do with the first, but it had all the same touch points. Yes. Evil Dead 3 sends them into medieval times. Nothing to do with anything. And then you got the Evil Dead remake. Amazing. By Fetty Alvarez. And now you got this. They don't connect, but they do. All. Yeah. And it's amazing. And I love where, where Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell and Rob Tappert, one of the original producers, where they're taking this. They're they're not being sequential. They're not being like, oh, in the last film. It just, it just, it just goes. And I love it. I think it's just, uh, I mean, as a horror film, and this, I just kind of realized this, this today, when I rate certain films personally, I have to rate them within the genre. Mm-hmm. And as a horror film, this bad boy does great. It's a nine. Yeah. Uh, God, I mean, not, we're not going to give away spoilers, but remember the scene when she's on the headphones listening and in this. Uh, oh, mm. yeah, oh. yeah, it's got some really gut wrenching, intense sequences. Uh, if you're a fan of the original uh, Evil Dead films, do yourself a favor. Go to the movies, go see it, steal it. Uh, don't, don't download it illegally. That's, no, no, never, never. That's illegal. We don't do that shit here. That's, no, no. that's bad. But. Go see it. You 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 won't be uh, disappointed. Yeah, if you have a stomach for gore. Oh. If you don't, the uh, oh, it was just so it. much yeah, fun. So fucking cool though. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. So I, I think we've uh, gushed and uh, enough on that one. Or maybe we've gutted it enough. Oh God. <laughs> but let's not blow our tops here. <laughs> so on that note. <laughs> Uh, before we dive into this episode, uh, I, we need to address a bit of controversy that arose from the last episode. See, here's the thing. I'm innocent here. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. I yeah. just want to state that. Yeah, you 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 rode along with it, so you're an uh, accessory I, I after the it. fact. I was dead tired that day. I, was, <laughs> I wouldn't believe anything you told me. Okay, well, we're talking about, we did our last episode on music legends on film. And after we covered off our main films, we discussed other films that were worth mentioning. And one of them was the film Selena. Mm-hmm. And I stated that it was played by J-Lo, which was correct. It was. And it was the story of Selena Gomez. It's so fucking wrong. Okay. Here's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my defense, okay, it's it, in all due respect to Selena, who was a great artist, Selena Quintanilla. Correct. That was her name. Selena Gomez was the little teeny bopper in the Disney Channel, Mm -hmm. and God knows whatever she's done, but it's a different, yeah, well, different person. Yep. Yeah. But again, to my my credit, to my defense, Mm. A... There's not, I don't know many Selenas in in, in, in celebrity world, okay? Mm -hmm. Only two, Selena Gomez and Selena... Quintanilla. Quintanilla, let's get that right. Yeah. They're both of Mexican descent. Mm Mm-hmm. They both sing. Yep. And they're both from Texas. Coinkadink. I, you know what? So can't, can't fault me. So to all of those who are, I've offended, pissed off, <laughs> annoyed, I know there was people like listening to the pod and going, "You idiot! No, that's that." You know, I apologize. So yeah. and 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 Carlos was in on it from the beginning. I was innocent so, from the very beginning. So let's move along. Uh, <laughs> so. Let's dive into today's to uh, into today's episode and let's get our shit right this time. Correct. Okay, so we're talking about the western again. It's been around since uh, the beginning of film, you know, and it's been a staple genre uh, that just it may have faded, but it hasn't gone away. It, every now and then, it pops up. Mm-hmm. So now, this first film, pretty much, this is the one that gave a rebirth. The, the first one we're going to cover, 
it kind of gave a rebirth to the Western genre mm -hmm. in the mid to late 60s. 60s. Yeah, 60s. 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 <laughs> I don't know. I feel like spicing it up. I, I, fear, I hear myself just going, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. gotta gotta add a little bit more spice into it yeah there you go no no mm -hmm. yeah. mm. oh that's oh. interesting 60s yeah selena gomez that's right <laughs> 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 okay so this first one again it was the one that kind of gave rebirth to the western baxter's over there rojo's there me right in the middle if you're thinking what I suspect, I tell you, don't try it. It's the story of a wandering gunfighter who plays two rival families against each other in a town, a small town that's torn apart by greed, pride, and revenge. The film is A Fist Full of Dollars from 1964, directed by Sergio Leone, and it stars Clint Eastwood. So, your first takes... My okay, listen. This is this might be a hot take. I don't really know. I don't really care. The first time <laughs> I was watching this movie, or the the time that because I've only seen it once. Uh, the time that I was watching, I was like, wait a minute, this is awfully familiar, man. Yes. Because I remember when I took a film class in in college, and I was talking about uh, one of the movies that we were watching was um Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Yojimbo, exactly. Yeah. And I was I was thinking to myself, damn. This is a lot like Yojimbo. It is Yojimbo. Dude goes into town. He's wandering. Big rivalry going on. And he's just kind of playing middleman, benefit, benefiting from everything. Yeah, exactly. You know, now I have seen the three films we're covering today. I, I've, I saw them when I was a kid. My mom and dad were big time drive-in goers. So we would always go to the drive-in and I, I'd see them and then I'd watch them on television. So I've seen these films before, but... It, the last time I seen these films was maybe about 15, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching it, this very one, and the, I'm, I'm like, okay, he goes into town. There's these two gang families that are running the town. They hate each other. He's in there. He plays one against the other. He takes money here. He takes money there. He takes money there, and it has them, you know. Fighting against each other. And, and yeah, until they, all, they fuck each other up until there's nobody left and he's there with a fistful of dollars. Of dollars. Yeah. And I'm watching it. Wow, this is Kurosawa's Yojimbo. Yeah. So this will be, you know, there was tw uh, another remake actually, kind of, of Yojimbo. Mm -hmm. And I forgot what year it is uh, it, that it came out and maybe the mid 2000s. It was called Last Man Standing mm -hmm. with Bruce Willis. Oh. And it's an old, like, ghost town, western town. Mm -hmm. And you got 1940s mafia. Two got you know, two gangs in this little town. And he, here comes this wanderer, and he plays them off against each other. Hey, you know he's talking smack about you? Oh, what? Hey, you know what? Give me give me like 50. I'll go take care of it. Yeah, and he, he goes, yeah, it was hilarious. So, but, you know, Kurosawa, you know, this is not the first time this has uh, been adapted. Mm -hmm. The Seven Samurai. Oh, that one was uh, done into something different too, no? Yeah, the Magnificent Seven yeah. in in the sixties, and then of course the Magnificent Seven remake that came out. What was it a few years ago? Yeah, with, uh, Chris, with uh, yeah Chris Pratt and Denzel Washington, and it was it was pretty good. Not a whole cast. Now I'm a huge fan of the original. To me, it's one of the greatest westerns ever made, in my personal opinion. But I love the film. It's interesting how, and now keep in mind that the Italian western was not born with this one. Mm -hmm. uh, or as they say in uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the Spaghetti Western. The Spaghetti Western. I mean, they had been around for a few years at that point, but it wasn't until this one that really brought it out in the forefront. But, I mean, I loved it. I mean, one of my favorite uh, lines in the film was where he first gets into town and he goes to pick a fight. <laughs> <laughs> and he passes by the guy who builds the, uh, the coffins. The coffins, yeah. And he goes, you know, he passes by, I'm going to need three graves. Three graves, and he goes and kills four people, and <laughs> in such a classic Clint Eastwood way, he walks back and he's like, "My mistake, four, four graves." <laughs> oh, I mean, it had some really, really great humor, but it was dirty, it was gritty, it was sweaty. Uh, watching this film, you just want to take shower yeah, afterwards. A little bit. I'm you seeing know? all the all the dirt and everything, all the grime and all of everyone. Yeah, I just kind of want to get a sponge and just kind of scrub at them. Yeah, scrub them. Yeah. 
Here we are. Here's some soap and water. But, you know, I think that stems from a couple of things. First of all, it's the Italian or the European ver- uh, way they view our films. Because if you look at these films, they are very tropey. Mm-hmm. of the um, the American Western. So it's like, this is their interpretation of the Western. And in doing so, they created something that is uniquely Italian yeah. or the Italian Western, that's spaghetti Western. And, it, it, and also the movement of the Italian neorealism that was prevalent in the early 70s. I'm not going to bore anybody with this uh, film history stuff. I think it's kind of cool. Like yeah. you got the bicycle thief. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you use real sets. I mean, you don't build a set. You film. On location. You film on location. And <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I just coughed. I'm going to edit that out. Ah. Yeah. But um, you, you get that realism. And he he infused that in, in, the, uh, in these Westerns. And starting with this one. You, yeah, you just get down and gritty. But Clint Eastwood was... Uh, just amazing. And did you have it? I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot of. Uh, it seems all dubbed. Uh, okay, so I was getting a little upset when I was watching because I was thinking that it was off sync, and I was gonna, I was gonna have to like, I don't know if I could have, but on my TV, just kind of like pause it, let the audio play, and then play it at the same time. I don't know if I can do that. I was just thinking about it, and then it would fix itself. I was thinking about like, oh, okay, whatever. Kind of gets off sync a little bit. Right. And the reason because it was an all European crew, uh, an American crew, and you had people who spoke English but couldn't speak Italian. You had people speaking Italian, couldn't speak English. Mm-hmm. A lot of the cast only spoke Italian. And if they did speak English, they can barely speak it and vice versa. So they just went what they called MOS, without sound or without sound. Mm-hmm. And they just dubbed the entire freaking movie. Question. Yeah. Why is it MOS if it's without sound? Otto Preminger, who was a uh, famous director back, oh, I'd have to say in the 20s and 30s. Uh No, my bad. 30s on up, around that time, maybe the 40s. Uh, He was a German director. Okay. And, you know, you had uh, scenes that you film that you don't use sound. Right. You you know, throw music on there. And you usually have the director say, okay, this one's going to be without sound. Uh Uh-huh. He was German, and he had a strong accent. Uh, and he goes, "This meet out sound." Ah, uh, M tur- or W turned into M. Got exactly. it, got it, got it. And what's funny is that that phrase is still used to this day on film. You'll have the slate, you know, the little clapper, uh-huh. and it'll say MOS. MOS? Yeah. Uh-huh. So it stuck. It became the uh, regular vernacular of filmmaking. Vernacular, nice, yeah. nice. Thank yeah. you. That's a five syllable word right there. Vernacular. Yeah. Is it four? You four. four. Yeah. Damn. Four. Yeah. Wrong again. Wrong again, man. Okay. So, uh, hush, hush Gomez. <laughs> <laughs> so next up is the second in the series, which has been dubbed as the, the, uh, the dollars trilogy and the Sergio Leone trilogy is, uh, in the spaghetti Western sees the return of a familiar face and a new one to rival Clint Eastwood for the title of ultimate Badass. Mm-hmm. When I get my hands on Indio and that ten thousand dollars, I'm gonna buy myself another place, possibly retire. But you forget one small detail. I want to get my hands on Indio too. So this one is a story of two bounty hunters with the same intentions to team up to track down an escaped. Mexican outlaw. The film is for a few dollars more from 1965, also directed by Sergio Leone. Now, this part of the trilogy, I loved. Now, see, here's the thing. Now that I'm thinking about it, it kind of like draws a comparison between like Alien and Aliens. Okay. You, you know, you know what I mean. Like the first one, it sets up the premise. You got a, a dude. He's cool. He's in a Western like setting, right? And then the second one, you just get straight up action, man. Yeah, because between the two bounty hunters, I don't remember the dude's name, but I remember like Cle- Lee Van Cleef. Ese, uh-huh, oh, oh, that, that one. That guy's badass. Man, between the two of them. Yeah. Woo-hoo. Well, you know, again, to reiterate, I saw these films when I was a kid, and so I really didn't remember him in detail. You know, I just saw these images of sweaty cowboys shooting each other and close up of eyes and everything. Yeah, you yeah. know, and so. I'm watching this and it's picking up good action. And here comes Lee Van Cleef mm. in his really 
cool, like fancy outfit and his badass gun. And I mean, he out badassed Clint Eastwood. Yeah. I mean, uh, it was, easily in a couple scenes you're thinking like damn man yeah I mean I loved it I mean just like we heard we heard in the clip when he goes on about how you know I'm gonna kill what was his name Indio Indio yeah and he's you know I'm gonna do this Clint Eastwood says I'm gonna do this I'm gonna, and now I'm, I'm gonna get Indio he goes you're right except for one thing I I'm gonna get Indio you know it's like <laughs> oh like he was killer and even the uh, the climax uh, the the ending with the musical watch yeah it was, cool, it was beautiful and of course let's not forget to mention er- Ennio Marconi mm-hmm. the composer and pretty much the godfather of what the Italian western sounds like the music oh man I mean so iconic I mean they even use it in the uh, Modelo commercials now <laughs> it, it, I didn't realize it was from the movie did you know this no no I didn't he's like yeah if I'm sure you've everyone out there has seen these commercials. Modelo is like the champion, you know, the champions are made of this or whatever the fuck, right? Yeah. But I didn't put it one in one together, and I'm watching the movies. I'm like, oh shit, that's Modelo. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you want to grab a beer real quick. Yeah. I, I, although it was like nine o'clock in the morning when I was watching it, but it's five o'clock somewhere, baby. I agree. And uh, so, what was great? I mean, this one really picked up the pace and the coolness factor. And, the, and again, going back to that, that finale when Lee Van Cleef's character confronts Indio, the villain, mm-hmm. and it starts off with the music from the uh, from the watch. And it's all, by the way, it's all about vengeance at this point because Indio killed um, Lee Van Cleef's wife or something. Sister. Like, sister. Son. Yeah. Well, it wasn't Lee Van Cleef's sister because he was sleeping with her. It was Indio's sister. Oh, it was somebody's sister. I remember the word sister was thrown around. Right. It was Indio's sister that Lee Van Cleef was into, and they were in love, and they had this watch that had music, and Indio killed her and Mm -hmm. tried to kill Lee Van Cleef's character. So it's all about vengeance. So in this climax, you have the music starts to play on the watch, and it builds into this crescendo of orchestral music by Ennio Marconi, Mm -hmm. and it just blends and becomes grand and epic, and you got the tight close-ups and you got the itchy hands ready to grab the gun and kill each other holy shit i mean i loved it i was Mm. sitting there like oh yeah yeah i mean i was just blown away definitely one of the best in my opinion the first one was really good you can't take it away because it was the first of its kind yeah but the second one really ramped it up it really upped the factor of like the entire uh, western yeah it, it definitely did the slight humor the coolness factor uh, again, you know, using the Italian neorealism factor, making it very realistic and gritty. I mean, you can almost smell these nasty fuckers on the move. <laughs> <clears throat> really, you sit there go, yo, this, this guy, he this guy needed a fucking shower. He bro. stinks. But it was really well done. And I love the look. And there was a, there, you know, the Italian Western, the spaghetti Western became very popular uh, af- at this point. But again, I, he, he, Lee Van Cleef. In fact, you know, he, he was the inspiration for. Uh, Cad Bane in the Star Wars film. I believe it same fucking look man yeah he looks identical you know with the wide brim hat and the beady eyes yeah and, but it's funny because watching it again some of the like the the clay uh, houses mm-hmm. in the desert and the desert shots it reminded me a lot of Star Wars Tatooine right there Tatooine yeah. the um, you know the the Adobe style I think are they Adobe Oh, fuck, I'm not an architect, so I don't, you know. Uh, <clears throat> you know, know. that style of, of desert houses. Yeah. We just go there so we don't sound like idiots. Okay. You know, desert houses. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it looked like a lot like Star Wars, even the, the pacing. I mean, Star Wars did have elements of a Western mm-hmm. as well. Also, Lee Van Cleef's gun, the one that's a two-piecer. Yeah. It's the stock and the pistol with a super long barrel. Yeah. As soon as he broke that sucker out, I'm like, Boba Fett. Yeah, man. it was Boba Fett's rifle. So Lucas definitely drew a lot of inspiration from these spaghetti westerns. Mm-hmm. Although I never heard anybody uh, mention this, you know, in, in the multitude of anal- you know, people analyze Star Wars and to discuss it. I've never heard that angle, but I saw it. You see it, and you, you can't unsee it. The houses, the gun, you know, the, the oh. character designs. Yeah. Uh, so, was, I mean, definitely ranks up there with one of my favorites of the Sergio Leone Clint Eastwood films. Uh, so, the next one, 
that we're going to talk about is basically pretty much the final film, Sergio Leone uh, trilogy. Trilogy, yeah. And this one, well, let's just hear the clip. Peaceful and quiet, amigo. Like a cemetery, for instance? Maybe. So this was about, uh, it's a bounty hunting scam. Uh, two guys that uh, join an uneasy alliance against a third in a race to find a fortune in gold buried in a cemetery. The film we're talking about is The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly from 1966, also directed by Sergio Leone. So, the big question with that one is, who is who? Who's the bad, who's the good, and who's the ugly? Well, the good would be Clint Eastwood. Mm-hmm, for sure. The bad is Lee Van Cleef. Ooh. And the ugly is Eli Wallach, ah. who plays Clint Eastwood's scam partner. What they do is, you didn't get to see this one, right? No, this one I didn't. Uh, Clint Eastwood and uh, Eli Wallach's character, what they do is, Eli Wallach's character, he is wanted for all kinds of crimes. Mm-hmm. A, a shit ton of crimes. He just a whole list of stuff that he did. Same, I can relate to that, man. So Clint Eastwood, the bounty hunter, turns him in, gets uh-huh. the money. Now they're gonna hang Eli Wallach. Mm-hmm. So from a distance, Clint Eastwood shoots the the rope out and saves Eli Wallach, takes him out of town, and they split the money. It was a pretty good scam, right, it, you bad. know, really neat. And of course, uh, the you know story pops in about uh, you know this stolen gold or something that's buried in somebody's cemetery. Now, to put uh, this discussion into context, I saw both movies early in the morning, the first two, mm-hmm. and w- was thoroughly uh, enjoying them. Yeah. And so I started watching the third one. Now, I may be in the school of unpopular opinion, but I got bored with this one. Uh, so I'm like, okay, let me go grab some coffee. So I paused it, right? And I'm thinking I'm like an hour into this film, eh, maybe 45 minutes more. So I pause it. Yeah. There was still an hour and 45 fucking minutes left on this thing. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? There's an entire movie left over. I'm like, no, I'm done. And I saw enough to figure out what the movie was about and what I remember when I saw it as a kid and yada, yada, sweaty people, bullets, people died, you know, yeah. you know, yeah, stinky people. Cool one-liners. Cool no. one-liners. But I definitely found this one a lot slower and not as uh, eventful as mm-hmm. the first two. It wasn't horrible, but it was a bit slower in, in, in pace. I mean, it kind of feels like it follows a trilogy syndrome. The first one is good. The second one is fantastic. The third one sucks. Mm. Or it's not as good. Yeah. And I think that's what happens here. It was okay. But what's interesting, I mean, what kind of threw me off was, okay, I finished watching for a few dollars more. Cool, badass, everything you ever want. Yeah. Yeah, I'm stoked. I'm like, oh, and the third one has Eli. Yeah, what's his name? Uh, uh Lee Van Cleef. Mm-hmm. The you know the, the cool dude, yeah. the other bounty hunter. I'm like, oh hell yeah, Clint Eastwood. So I'm watching this right, and I'm a little confused. He's not the same character as the second film. Okay. Same actor, different character. He's the bad, but he was good. I got oh. confused. Okay? okay. And so I'm like, okay, I guess they figured he did so well in the second one. Let's bring him back, but change his character because I don't know. Right. They probably had the script already written and they couldn't change the character, but they wanted him back. And okay, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give, you, give you the part that we had for somebody else. but you know. Yeah, we're going to fucking confuse our audience, but so what? You're back. And he was cool in it. Mm-hmm. Secondly, the villain in this third one they he's in a jail and they're gonna break him out so he's in bed or in his bunk and he has something over his face and they break him out <laughs> they reveal his face uh-huh and it's the same villain from the second movie <laughs> indio no it's a different character now i forgot his name oh rojo no rojo was rojo his... was the friend the, from the first one it was i don't know rojo we... was the villain from the, um um uh the first what was the first one called? Uh, Fistful of dollars. Fistful of dollars. Rojo was Fistful of dollars. Okay, that Indio was, a... was the, from for a few dollars more. And the third one, I forgot his name, but it's the same actor. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, wait, I'm getting fucked up here. Wait a minute. Either way, they reuse actors, they change their names, 
somebody new. Yeah. Remember the little kid in the second one that... The one that guides them to the hotel? Yeah. The, okay, yeah. He's like, oh, you know, you see anything new? And the kid's like, maybe. maybe? And yeah. he tosses yeah, them, them a dollar. Gives yeah. them a dollar. The kid starts talking. That same kid is in the third film. Mm-hmm. Different person. <laughs> yeah. I don't Talk know. about reusability, man. And there was even another character in the third film that was also used in the second film. Either Italy, they, where they were filming in Italy, there was only like 10 actors available, mm-hmm. or they just decided we'll use the same people and we're going to screw up continuity and just make a different story. It's okay. But it worked. Yeah. Um, but it was, uh, like I said, I, I didn't really enjoy it as much. And it was way too long. I mean, the first two, what was the first one? Like two hours, 20 no, minutes? No, the first one ran like an hour and 40. The oh. second one ran on out two hours and a minute. Okay. And, and then the third one was two hours and 40 minutes. That's, yeah. That's why I said, screw this. Um, I wasn't enjoying it. I mean, it has its cultural cultural rev- relevance in... Uh, reverence. In, reverence. Irrelevance in, in the, the genre of Westerns, and it has its uh, hallmark, you know, position in the Hall of Fame of Westerns. But, yeah, I, I really didn't care much for it. And, but yeah. it was all right. So, I can't say I can't talk about it. I didn't see it. Yeah, I, I wouldn't recommend it. I, I saw mean, the first two, and I was like, okay, I get the gist. Yeah, and you know what? Yeah, that's all you have to do is watch the first. Now, if you're a completist, you'll watch all three of them. But in this case, I don't know if it's really worth it. Yeah, I have to take a hard pass on it. So, though, so pretty much that covers the three films, the three uh, Hallmark films of Western. Now, why do we choose those? Because there's tons of Westerns. Again, let's, let's go back to the early 1900s uh, with the great ch- train robbery. Uh, there's so many Westerns that just came up from there. You had just uh, Western stars like Tom Mix, Gene Autry, Audie Murphy into the 30s and 40s, uh, Gary Cooper. So there was a lot of great uh, um, Westerns. But why start there? Mm-hmm where we started well that was kind of like the renaissance of the western okay kind of like the rebirth of it yeah getting it back into the limelight yeah and and it really hadn't died out at that point but there was kind of like a lull Mm -hmm. in its popularity the golden age was roughly about the 40s and 50s and it kind of rolled into the early 60s but that was about it that's where it started to just kind of become do- stagnant stagnant thank you eh. Ooh, stagnant good word I don't know when I did my English class three syllables um, I think also in the 60s you saw a, a change in cultural attitudes it was you know you had the the hippie movement and music was changing traditionalism was kind of out the window mm-hmm. you know the nuclear family was a thing of the past so the western gave way to more like uh, the political thrillers the sci-fi films that were kind of like popping in and stuff so the western was kind of getting kicked to the side and you know but meanwhile there was a movement in Italy and in Europe with these Italian uh, the spaghetti westerns but it, the reason they came they came out here the way they came became popular in the US was because of Clint Eastwood Clint Eastwood was in a TV series, don't know how many years it ran, almost like nine, ten years. Oh, okay, so it was there for a minute. Yeah, it was a series called Rawhide, and he was very popular and very well known on this series. It was a Western TV show. Again, the Western was super popular on the small screen, Mm -hmm. and Clint Eastwood was part of that, that movement on TV of the popular Western. And so around 64, 65 was the end of the series, and he needed work and his agent basically called now this is roughly the gist of his story but he gets a call from his agent hey you got a job offer for a western clint eastwood is like great awesome yeah where is it am i going to shoot in utah new mexico no it's going to be in italy uh sergio leone uh a director from italy he's going to be doing this film and he wants you in it okay i sure i guess yeah he was he, he was kind of skeptical about it like i don't know but he went he went for it anyway it was a job yeah uh, although he wasn't the first to be approached there was a few other actors that were approached before him i know charles bronson was approached i can't remember who else but finally they settled on clint eastwood because he was the only one who said yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so he took it and you know what it became his career mm-hmm. i mean his his defining moment this was it made him a legend and talk about legends you had your western uh, stars like I mentioned Gene Autry uh, Tom Mix and you had your TV personalities 
personalities like uh, Hopalong Cassidy, which is way before your time, mm. my time too. Oh. Uh, uh-huh. No, for real, it was before <laughs> my time. Uh, but and then came John Wayne. Mm-hmm. Who, uh, see, that's the name I recognize. Yes, and he was the king of the Westerns. He was the man in Westerns. I forgot what film, what was his debut film, but it was a film, uh, after that, it was a film called Stagecoach that just catapulted him into the world of the Western. Mm-hmm. And, tr- you know, with classics like The Comancheros, uh, True Grid, The Searchers, and so many amazing films that John, May- uh, John Wayne uh, worked on. So he was the king of the Western mm-hmm. until, you know, the fall of the Western a little bit. And he got older, of course, and he didn't make as many Westerns in the 60s as he did earlier. And, of course, Clint Eastwood took that mantle and became the king of the Westerns. And unfortunately, the way cinema is work is kind of gearing towards now, the way the industry is, the way films are getting made and or not made, I think um, Clint Eastwood is pretty much going to be the last yeah. in that line of, of the king of the cowboys of the Western. Because I don't, I don't really see one being very popular nowadays. Nothing. I know, uh, I forgot who, Pedro Pascal is working on a Western. I would watch one if it had Pedro Pascal. Yeah. Um, I mean, ba- okay, hey me, whatever. Mandalorian is just basically a, a space Western. Basically. Uh, with robots and aliens and everything And else. it's a damn good show. It is a Western. Uh, so I think he would fit perfectly in that genre. But after the Clint Eastwood era, in going into the 70s, the Western, again, was still around. You know, you still had your Westerns pop in and out throughout the 70s. But they pretty much died out, especially once we saw the 80s pop in. Oh, yeah. It was all about sci-fi, fantasy, adventure. Future tech, you know, everything like that. It it was good stuff. The Western just kind of disappeared. It wasn't until, like, uh, the early 80s when uh, there was these two brothers, uh, Lawrence Kasdan, and I forget his his brother, but Lawrence Kasdan is the screenwriter for mm-hmm. Raiders of the Lost Ark and uh, The Empire Strikes Back and other great scripts. I mean, he's a great writer. Yeah. So him and his brother are hanging out one day and they're like, you know, God, you know, they're missing the Western because that's what they grew up on. Yeah. And, you know, why don't we, they make Westerns like that anymore? I mean, they're fantastic. I, I miss those. And one brother basically turns to the other and says, hey. Why don't we just write one? Yeah, we're filmmakers. Why don't we do it? We can, you know, we have the pull. And thus was born Silverado, eh. which is a high adventure, epic, beautiful Western. And they used all the fantastic tropes. In fact, it was heavily inspired by the Magnificent Seven in its score, uh, its cinematography, uh, the, you know, larger than life characters. Mm-hmm. And it was great. It had uh, Kevin Klein, uh, Danny Glover from Lethal Weapon. Kevin Costner was in it when he was super young. Okay. I forgot who else is in it, but they had a stacked cast, and it was beautiful. And, and that was about 81, I believe, that it came out in. And it was a damn good Western, but it didn't revive the Western. It was just, boom, and it died back again. Yeah. But it wasn't until, like, 93, 92. I forgot what year. I, I'm, 90 something. 90 something. We'll stick with 93. Okay. And, and uh, if I'm wrong, I'll have to come out on next week's episode and apologize and correct myself again. 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 Uh, it wasn't until like 93 when Kevin Costner released Dances with Wolves. Oh, that was a damn good movie, too. Beautiful film. Not your traditional Western where you got the gunslinging hero and, the, you know, and all this stuff, but it was a Western. And it kind of brought the Western back to, you know, to the popularity you know of, of the audiences They're like wow this is great so then you know you have uh, a few films that spawned from that point you have tombstone mm-hmm. sam elliott bill paxton kurt russell i mean this this, this movie was fantastic that stacked cast too and that was a little interesting side note about that movie tombstone it was directed by george p cosmatos and there's a story behind that that he didn't direct it uh-huh He's, he wasn't a very... It was his ghost. Well, he was a, he was, I guess he wasn't a hands-on director. Or he was, really wasn't involved, and he wasn't getting the most out of his scenes. So Kurt Russell is said to have stepped in and just said, you know, I'm directing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Keep the name. You can, you know, you're director of the film, but I'm going to fix this mess. Mm-hmm. And 
maybe that's why it was an amazing film. You have not seen Tombstone. Correct. Amazing. Oh, Val Kilmer is also hey. in it. And he plays Doc Holliday. Kurt Russell plays Wyatt Earp, who's a legendary lawman. And it has to do with the shootout at the OK Corral. And it's fantastic. Love this movie to death. It's amazing. Um, but this is not the uh, this is not the first time this happened to George Cosmatos. Mm-hmm. He directed, I believe it was Rambo 2 or 3. I forget which one he... I think it was the third one. The one set in Afghanistan. Uh-huh. Same thing. Stallone had to step in. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sucks. I mean, the guy... No, it doesn't kind of suck. It's like, hey, Joe, we're going to assign you to to the, you know, windmill. Just uh, torture the rice all day or whatever, torture the grain all day. Yeah. And it's kind of like, eh. You're kind of doing it, you're kind of not. So somebody else has to step in and do your job. Yeah, you get the credit, but you you really didn't do shit. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's kind of sad because Cosmatos is known for, you know, he directed Rambo and he directed Tombstone, but he didn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, But another notable uh, film is also The Quick and the Dead. Now, I think you're going to dig this one. Mm-hmm. It stars Gene Hackman. Okay. Leonardo DiCaprio. Oh. Sharon Stone. Okay. And Russell Crowe. Hey, okay. And it's directed by Sam Raimi. Ah, uh, sold. Yeah. Just start with Raimi. Now, you know Sam Raimi, is, uh, you've just seen uh, The Evil Dead yeah. uh, rise. His style of filmmaking, he's very, he loves to fuck with the camera. He likes to get it down low. He likes to move it. He likes to kind of freak you out and do creative things with the camera. Yeah. He does that in this too, where he really moves things around. This is one scene. Uh, it's a tropey kind of sequence where the sheriff takes off his badge and throws it into the sand. Mm-hmm. And Raimi has the camera at a low angle. And the and the star, the badge, is thrown towards the camera in slow motion. And you see it spinning mm-hmm. until it lands right in front of the camera. Stuff like that. Okay. Great film. A lot of fun. I mean, I, I thought it was a really good uh, revival western uh, also, you have Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman. And it basically, it's about two aging uh, gunslingers slash killers mm-hmm. that they left their life behind, but they're kind of drawn back into it. And it's a whole thing about the, you know, the violence of the Old West and, and killing and how that's, it really, um, these, you know, dissolves the soul and all this kind of stuff. It's a good film. One Best Picture. Okay. And it's a really good film. I uh, really enjoyed that one. But, uh, I mean, I, I love the Western. And every again, every now and then, a new You'll one. You'll see one pop out every every other while. Yeah, and I love them. I, I enjoy Westerns. Like Cowboys versus Aliens. Okay, that was not a Western. <laughs> I don't know if you can count that one as a Western. That was pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't remember much about it, but I know it had um, uh, James Bond in it. Yeah, uh, uh, Daniel Craig and Harrison Ford yeah. was in this. That was fun. And I'm thinking, oh, you can't go wrong, you know? Yes, you can. Then you can. You, I think it was based on Topps Comics. I have no clue. I believe it was It was definitely based on something, kind of like uh, Mars Attacks. <laughs> Love that movie. Yeah, where you take a ridiculous concept and it, it had potential, but no, it was it was bad. <laughs> It was embarrassing. <laughs> one of those, one of those movies that you watch, and you go, "I'm kind of embarrassed for the guy on the screen." Yeah, I'm embarrassed for the director. This is this is shit, you know. But uh, I love the western, and uh, again, every now and then you have like three ten to Yuma, the one that came out with it was Russell Crowe and Christian Bale. Oh, yeah, and that was pretty good. That was a lot of fun. Now, will the western ever rise to prominence again? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not time will tell yeah i mean right now we're still well we're we're finishing that that horrific wave of uh superhero films that's starting to die down i mean don't get me wrong i like a good superhero film but 50 fucking million of these things coming out every year no it it got tiresome yeah it it is gonna like uh what's it say it it affects the palettes it does it does and uh so i'm not really you know it's like okay another superhero film i'm not excited or whatever but you know there is we're we're seeing more diversity popping out into film and we're talking about story diversity and idea diversity versus the stale same formula of you know superheroes or star wars which i love star wars but uh but who knows maybe there will be another rise in the popularity of the western but Mm -hmm. i see it years from now yeah so not anytime soon yeah so i mean i enjoyed them 
for what they were. And uh, so, you know, what you get out of it, you actually got baptized into the world of the Spaghetti Western. I got some cool one-liners out of it. Some great one-liners. Yeah. And oh, great films. And uh, so I think that's about it. you have any uh, final statements and, uh, or, or things you want to say before we close this bad boy out? What? If you if you're looking for war, make sure to look for two tombstones. Wait, how's it called? If you're picking a fight, make sure to dig two graves. Okay, there you go. <laughs> what movie was that from? I don't know. It just popped in my head. <laughs> okay, you know what? It sounded legit. Yeah, I'll give you points for that. Heck yeah. Okay, so uh, that about does it for uh, for our, for this episode. We hope you've enjoyed our show, and we hope you will join us next week for an all new episode. So please uh, help to support the podcast and give us a nice rating and a good review. Another way you can uh, help support the podcast is simply to subscribe and or follow us on Amazon, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Deezer, Audible, Boomplay, or wherever you get your podcast fix. Also, please, you know, just keep in mind, we're not a monetized podcast. We don't ask for money. We don't ask for uh you know, donations, handouts, or anything. We we do this for free. We do this because we love to talk film. So best way, just support us. Recommend us to a friend, an enemy, an actor who's gonna play the same role in three different films, or the same person in three different films. But we'll go by a different name in each, and we get three different three subscribers. Different yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Each All one. right. Sounds good. Also, don't forget to check us out on our Facebook uh, group page. Uh, check us out on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and on our YouTube channel for updates. Uh, also, keep in mind on our Facebook uh, uh, page, our Facebook group. That's where we drop trailers for our upcoming episodes. So pay us a visit there and drop some comments and uh, let us know what you think of the show. Uh, you can also contact us directly uh, via email at the Film Joe pod at gmail.com we'd love to hear from you so keep in mind all these links they're in our show notes so please check them out again carlos any final words uh why uh um yeah uh, cowboys okay cowboys there's our final word of the day so <laughs> again hope you enjoyed it <laughs> i'm joe i'm carlos and this is the film joe podcast where, where film, film talk, talk happens, happens.